In the year 987, Russian ambassadors came south into the sun to see Byzantium. They told their prince, the ambitious prince of Kiev, that they couldn't begin to describe the splendor of Saint Sophia. They could only say that God dwelt here within it, and they were all baptized. Just as it intended, Byzantium had dominated its neighbors with pious splendor and magnificence. These Russians, though, were tough and warlike. Despite their newfound faith, they still hovered dangerously on Byzantium's northern borders. Rather than dispatch grand armies to subdue them, the Byzantines employed images of God and government. They built churches in Central Europe, the like of which the Northerners had never seen. And sometimes, too, the Byzantines sent bishops and ambassadors, men laden with wisdom, relics and the word of God. The Byzantines didn't like to travel north in the winter. The diplomats had to go sometimes with little bars of gold stamped with the emperor's name, wrapped in furs and stuffed under the sledge out of the way. The gold to bribe local chieftains to attack one another rather than to go and attack Constantinople. It was a terrifying journey. First of all, you went to a Byzantine border fort. There the governor tried to grab a few of the sons of the local princes to keep them under control. And then you set out across the icy wastes. When you met some villages, you might give them some silk, brocade or pepper or leather. But always out there are shadows hiding in the woods with a pechen egg. These were ancient tribesmen who really prided themselves on killing travellers. After months of travel, you'd arrive at the side of the frozen river Dnieper and look up at the great fortress of the ruler of Kiev, the prince of the Varangian Rus. Before Byzantium, the princes of Kiev had all lived in wooden huts. These towers and domes and all the dreams they hold came here from old Byzantium. And the story of their making is an extraordinary tale. This little area here was once the centre of Kievan Rus, a little stockade just 600 yards across. Now you've got to think, it's the year 988. There's Prince Vladimir, a Byzantine bishop, and a lot of Byzantine craftsmen are coming out here. It's just before dawn. It's very cold. And at a particular holy moment, after a prayer is said, they plant the position of the altar. And then, as the sun comes up, and a shadow is cast across the snow, a nobleman called Simon, so tradition tells us, took off a golden belt and they measured out 20 golden belt lengths. And that would be the first church in Vladimir's kingdom. It's an astonishing moment in history. It's the old technology of Greece and Rome, a thousand years after those empires are gone, going into parts of the world that they had never managed to conquer. Vladimir's church is gone now. There's still a few bits of the floor left, though. Some precious relics of a tremendous Byzantine achievement. Jacqueline, Jacqueline. You know, it's at times like this, archaeology really comes alive. Look, 
This isn't just a little of old bit of brick or mortar or something. These are the first bricks ever laid in Central Europe. It's not just stone on stone either. This is like somebody got into a Cadillac and drove it into the middle of the Amazon and parked it in a village where nobody had ever seen outside people before. This is astonishing. Look, it's only a bit of ceramic and a bit of mortar. You need two separate kiln masters with two separate kilns for that. They have to find the lime to make the mortar. They have to go to the river to find the clay down the road here. They have to build their kilns, cut the trees, and then they got them cutting stone, local stone, hewn from open quarries for the first time. The Russians didn't like working stone. There's an old Russian proverb. It is easier to teach an ill-tempered wife than it is to cut stone. But actually, their real problem was the weather. It was truly terrible. It was either freezing, freezing cold, and they complained bitterly that it was so difficult to lay bricks in fur-lined coats and mittens. And then when it thawed, this area was under massive mud, and they had to devise incredibly elaborate wooden structures to hold the building up at all when they extended the foundations. So this is an extraordinary enterprise. How ingenious those people were coming from the south. How determined it took them eight years to get this place up. They learnt, though, the next time they build a church in five years. This is the church they built, the Cathedral of St. Sophia of Kiev. Beneath the old Ukrainian domes, Byzantine brick and ancient Greek geometry. These could be the walls of an imperial church in ancient Constantinople. Inside, memories of the palace of all palaces and the church of all churches, the original Saint Sophia at Constantinople. and gleaming mosaics too, made by Byzantine craftsmen sent here to work for Vladimir's son, Prince Yaroslav. Carefully preserved images of Jesus, Mary and the saints, images of government and holiness to pacify the north. The heavenly court of old Byzantium, floating high above the Prince of Kiev. It's a heavenly court, now entirely mirrored in Yaroslav's new court on earth. Aided and abetted by a Byzantine bishop who wants him to punish sinners, to feed the poor, and to fight the enemies of Byzantium. But there's something else going on in this wondrous building. Something else yet more subtle. It's like a soap opera here. It imparts manner, it imparts gesture. It shows you the Byzantine way of walking and talking. And between that fierce structure and this new manner, the old order of Rus was entirely swept away. 